And then to think of myself as an onlooker, someone from the village. First of all, I would have known that Jesus was in town. Everybody in these little villages would have known that Jesus and his 12 disciples had come into town. And then he goes and he heals this man of dropsy. Everybody knew who this man with dropsy was. This was a small village that was probably much smaller than this building. This would have been the, the talk of the town for two or three months after Jesus came in. Everybody would have thought, what is going on here? This doesn't fit. We don't know how to categorize this. It's unexpected. You don't operate this way. It's upside down. Because the God that Jesus is, is upside down. See, it's not just the kid, that, that the kingdom is upside down and we've got to follow a set of rules to fit into the kingdom. It's about knowing the God who is upside down. This God who loves me more than I deserve. This God who loves others more than they deserve. This God who loves me even when I reject him. Or, and this God who loves others even when they reject him. This God who loves me enough to heal me even when I created my own pain. And what about the God who loves others even when they create their own pain? See, this is extravagant. This is unbounded. This is endless. And we don't know what to do with that kind of love because in our world, just like in the world of the first century, we have a tit-for-tat kind of love. I'll love you to the level that I think you deserve it. And therefore, God can love you to the level that I think you deserve it. You see, we are shaped by this world that, that I think is more like, well, I'm hurt, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. We, we judge, we feel judged, and we judge back. We, we feel rejected, we reject back. We judge those who aren't like us to protect ourselves, and we criticize those who think differently. We discount those who can't contribute to our world. We marginalize, we threaten, we shame, we set up categories for people, and then we put titles upon people and positions and power, and we set up rankings in our society and, and rankings of, well, those are those people and these are these people and these are these people and where are my people? And, and what category do we fall in? You see, that was what was going on that day. One of the, the best ways I've ever seen this illustrated is uh, as, when I was growing up on the farm, we had cattle and we would buy a new cow and put it in the trailer and drive it into the pasture and we'd drive out in the middle of the pasture and we'd open the back gate and the cow would go off into the pasture. And within 30 seconds to a minute, there could be 50 cattle in the field and they would somehow assess the new cow and say, hmm, that cow ranks about 22. And suddenly, cow 20, 21, 22, right in there, would suddenly start fighting the new cow. And it was, it was really unusual. Every time we introduced a new cow into the herd, this would always happen. And if it was an exceptionally large cow, it would be a fight between number one and a new one. And they would duke it out. I mean, not duke it out literally with their hooves. Move. And they'd be kind of <laughs> oh, yeah, come on. You want but to fight? You step up? You want the next peace? 15 to 20 minutes, they'd be fighting. Hey, Moo Moo. <laughs> You're taking this way too far. <laughs> His cows were very smart and also sinful. I, they were very sinful. I've never heard of cows. You know, it's like this. Let's this, rate the cows. The <laughs> ranking system has is, is infiltrated our whole society, our whole way of thinking in this world, our whole creation. Have this, have, we have this order of how things should be and who fits where and, and, and do I fit there? And if I do, how can I one-up you? Now, and that was what was going on when Jesus was encountering this, this group of 10 or 12 men who were sitting around this table. And at one, uh, it, it was probably a long rectangular table. And it, at one end of the table would have been the position of the prominent Pharisee. And to the right and the left would have been his, the most prominent positions. And the closer you got to it, the more important you were. And you, it was things going through their minds about if I sit closer to people of prominence, that's going to be more beneficial to me, possibly economically. Maybe I'll get a better seat at, at the synagogue and sit in the right place. Maybe I'll get more respect and I can actually teach in the synagogue or I can do this or I can do that. This is, this is something that was just going on through that. And as I inserted myself into the story, I realized that I identify a little bit too much with the guests of that day. 
that Jesus could probably be speaking this parable to me. That I too often enter into a room and I think, huh, who are the most prominent people in the room? I'll go to Chili's and, with a group of people and think, where do I need to position myself at this table to be closest to the funniest person here so I can act like I'm having the most fun? Or I'll enter into a party with a, a bigger group of people and I'll sit, look and say, is there anyone that's semi-famous around here? And think, well, if I act like I know him better or someone like him, then I'm going to... It's a big mistake, dude. <laughs> then I'm going to have more prominence in other people's eyes. And we even do this even with bigger, uh, more famous people. And we'll say, well, I was in New York on vacation and I saw Donald Trump across the street. Well, who cares? With his toupee. With his toupee. I mean, it's like we see somebody famous and we like, we saw Justin Morneau. I'm like, well, who cares? He struck out three times last week. You know, what difference does it make? But we do this because we, have, we, we, were, we, we were conditioned, we were shaped by the habits of our culture it says, if you are in positions of prominence, if you're in the right group, if you know the right people, then you are going to fit in better. You're going to have more power. You're going to have more authority. It's kind of like walking out into your high school or junior high uh, cafeteria and saying, which one of those tables is my table? And you know, you remember how, how it went. There were tables of prominence and authority and people who were popular, and then there were other tables were, that were less than popular, and then there were tables where people were marginalized, and then there were places where people did, who didn't have anybody set. All of this was going on, and this goes on in our, in our, in our minds, and, and we're shaped by these habits. We're shaped by this, this uh, way that we think is actually right side up. We think this is, this is the way the world should be, and this is the way we think God should work. That's what these men were thinking, that, that, that Jesus was going to operate according to a certain set of rules, and he was going to fit into their rules. But Jesus doesn't fit into our rules. The kingdom doesn't work the way we think it should work. It's more upside down than we even can fathom. And if we're going to understand how upside down this kingdom is and how upside down this God is, we have to develop upside-down habits. We have to develop habits that are going to help us see how upside-down the world really is. Because we are conditioned to think things a certain way, and we have to recondition our eyes and ears to see and hear what God is doing in this world. And this is the reason we do these adventures that are concentrated uh, times when we focus on a theme and we, we get repetitive and we, we hit hard on a, a specific theme to help chip away at how we've been conditioned and shaped. And during this time, we'll have short-term groups. And I hope you will participate in a short-term group. If you're not a part of one, please come to the Hub and, and check one out. And, or you can go home and check out online. We also have ways for you to develop new habits personally, to get into the Scriptures and to pray in a different way. And this is the reason we have uh, developed this uh, prayer journal, which we have available at the Hub. And in this prayer journal are places like to take sermon notes. And here's a question. It, you know, it's one thing to take sermon notes and go, wow, don't we have a great preacher? My preacher's better than your preacher. I go to Greg Boyd's church. And I, who cares? You're just gushing th this morning. Who, this? You know, but I say, who cares? Okay. So, so. Good. <laughs> oh, yeah? I care. What really matters is the question that's down here is, what do you sense God saying to you through this sermon? Because if you walk out of here and go, wow, that was awesome. I was really moved. But what is God saying to you? What's going on in your life right now? What's going on? What's God moving in your heart about? And then we have a place for you to journal. And there's some questions in here for you to reflect and think about the themes that we are focusing on each week. And then we have five days of praying the scriptures. You might think, well, I don't know how to pray very well. Well, here's a process for you to listen to the scriptures and for you to pray through the scriptures. It's an old, old tradition that's of using scriptures to guide prayer life. In addition, we are uh, doing something new this year, uh, or this with this adventure. We're going to be posting a blog on Monday through Friday on our website. And we'll be adding short insights uh, and reflections uh, each uh, on Mondays and, Mondays, through Mondays and Fridays through Friday to, um, uh, to continue to help us think about this and get this in us 
so that we can see things, what the, you see God's upside down kingdom. 